This is Lynn Fraser with the Killaby Center for Recovery. And I'm really delighted today to interview Gabor Maté for the second time for the Radical Recovery Summit. And today we're gonna to talk about psychedelics and how that works in the field of trauma and addiction. As we're looking at the field of addiction and treatment for addiction, one of the things that's really impressed me is how your understanding of trauma has contributed to the underlying understanding of why is it that people use addictive substances and processes. And in particular today, we're going to talk about the use of psychedelics. But what is it about trauma that you'd like people to really understand, especially how it relates to addiction? When you ask anybody what they get out of their addiction, what, they, what, they, what the benefit is in the short term, uh, they will tell you, it gives me inner peace. It, it makes me feel um, less anxious. It it it, it um, diminishes stress. It connects me to other people. It gives me a sense of control, um, temporary sense of meaning. It makes me feel more alive. Reduces the pain. Numbs me and all that. And all of these um, benefits speak to the fact that addictions are not ever anybody's primary problem. They're always an attempt to solve a problem. Right. When we look up on addictions as a disease or as a choice, we're missing the point. Um, addiction is one of the features of a disease, but it always begins and functions temporarily as a problem solver. And so the question is, what is the problem? And the problem in every case arises out of trauma. So that the, the, the template for addiction is trauma. Addiction is not the only outcome of trauma, but it's a common one and a major one. And nobody who gets addicted, whether to gambling, shopping, sex, internet, gaming, pornography, heroin, cocaine, crystal meth, nicotine, alcohol, eating, whatever it is, nobody gets addicted without an underlying traumatic template. Now, that trauma does not have to be uh, overtly horrible. Uh, trauma, if we understand it properly, is not what happens to us, but what happens inside us as a result of what happens to us. And what happens inside us is emotional pain, alienation of self, discussion from others, uh, boredom, emptiness, lack of meaning, suffering. That's what the trauma is. And the addiction is always an attempt to alleviate the temporary manifestation of the trauma. Right. And so one of the ways that we can do that is through therapy and kind of taking us maybe a slower path into really getting to know ourselves and to healing the trauma. And one of the ways that people are looking into, and you have been too for the last several years, is how to use certain plant medicine and other medicine to help with that process. So could you talk a little bit about ayahuasca in particular. And then I'd like to also, the last time we talked, MDMA had just been approved by the FDA. So I'd love to get some update on that as well. Okay. So traditionally, uh, tribal societies throughout the world um, have often used various plants um, as healing uh, modalities. Now in the Amazon basin, uh, which is to say the jungles of uh, Brazil, uh, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, there's a plant, or I should say a combination of plants, which are, are made into a brew. And having ingested the brew, the individual will have visions and uh, powerful feelings and uh, teachings even. The plant, that the brew is named after is its main ingredient called ayahuasca. Uh, that's what it's called in Peru. In uh, Colombia, they call it yahe. And they may have it elsewhere. And it's, but it's fundamentally, even if not everywhere, the same exact composition, fundamentally it contains the same ingredients. So there's evidence that this has been used for at least hundreds of years uh, in the Amazon. Um, quite likely before conquest, before uh, Caucasians came to, uh, to uh, the New World. Now in recent years, and I'd say in recent decades, 
we might say that the West or the North has quote unquote discovered ayahuasca, which is to say a lot of people are now participating in ayahuasca events. Many, many, many tens of thousands travel to these various countries in South America to participate in ayahuasca ceremonies under the guidance of shamans. And they find a lot of healing in it. And I could talk about what I found out about it, but in the last 10 years, I've been working with it myself and in, in that I facilitated retreats using ayahuasca and combining ayahuasca with uh, Western psychotherapeutic modalities. People brought to my attention, I experienced it, I saw the potential value in it, we developed a way of working with it. And I can do it. Now, it's not something I do a lot, like I do it maybe one or two weeks a year, but it's, a, it, you know, it's very impressive how well it works. One of the things that happens with trauma is that we shut down, we dissociate, we are scared of being with the pain inside, and that's what gives rise to all of the addictions. So ayahuasca tends to kind of let people come deeper into that quite quickly. That's one of the ways it can work is, is, is that it simply removes your defenses largely against the repressed material. So um, people can have powerful images, not just images, but actually emotional reverberations of the child trauma, along with an awareness that they're observing this as an adult, so that it's... Now, some people completely get immersed in their trauma state during the ayahuasca ceremony without any awareness that this is just me as an adult observing this compassionately. That's why you have to do it in, an, in a supportive, safe context. And it, it's, not, it's not a drug experience. It's not about you take this and you'll be okay. It's, a, it's really an interactive, shamanic um, event where the shaman works with you during the night to help you through these difficult spots. So it's not simply the chemical effect, it's actually a, a human process where the context, so the chanting, is very specific to help you through these difficult states and to support you. And sometimes that depends on and work energetically with you as well. But it's um, designed so that whatever you go through, you're going through it in a supportive, safe context, which is, of course, what didn't happen in the first place. Right, exactly. So, so whatever traumatic event occurred to you, when you endured it as a child, there was no safety, there was no support, there was no sense of somebody helping you, this is why you were traumatized. Right. So going through it with that kind of support is, can be very healing for people. And of course, they have to understand themselves. They also realize what has been driving them all their lives, what they've been running away from, what they've been trying to hide from, what they've been carrying inside without fully realizing it. So that's one aspect of the ayahuasca experience. It's not the only aspect. There's another one that's just as important. But in terms of trauma, it does highlight and help you see the trauma um, so that you no longer think you're crazy. You actually get what happened to you. Okay. So a lot of times people have so much negative self-talk and shame and recrimination around what happened. We really take that on as that's our own fault. How, how do you work with that? Well, so the setting that we organized is that prior to the ceremony, there, there'll be a day of preparation at least which is a group psychotherapeutic setting. You might, you might call it psychotherapy. I, I don't think of it as psychotherapy, but sharing, exploration. I, mean, I suppose you could call it psychotherapy. People um, explain why they've come, what they're looking for, what, what issue they're trying to resolve. And well before the ceremony, we explore very quickly, like with really laser-like um, sharpness, what exactly is going on for them and, 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 and what may have happened. So that by the time the ceremony comes, they're prepared to embrace it. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. so it doesn't come as a shock. In fact, some people might go into ceremony with the intention of 
destroying my childhood, right. teaching me about my fear, um, teaching me about my rage. So people are very specifically asking to be illuminated to difficult dynamics in their lives. And that's how they go into ceremony. So that preparation. Mm -hmm. um, when these states arise, if they, if they arise, and by the way, you can also have some very beautiful states arise, we can talk about that, but, but when these difficult states arise uh, during a uh, ceremony, people are really essentially taught to approach it like a meditation, like to observe it without getting attached to it, to, to, to observe it without resisting it, just to allow it to be, and to ask for help when they need it. Mm -hmm. Ask for help from the plant itself. And a lot of people experience the plant as an entity that comes to help them. I never have, personally. Very thick skull. But, but uh, a lot of people I've worked with have experienced it that way. Or helpers in the terminal space, whose job it is to sit with you and to hold you or just to hear you. And then the shamans, again, will be specifically picking up on your energy. So this is what's amazing, is that the ceremony is in the dark, usually. But the shaman, without speaking with you, are just picking up on your energy that you're experiencing. And they'll speak to that energy. And they'll, they'll chant to it, they'll sing to it. So that you're getting all kinds of support. So the conscious mind isn't where the main arena is. It's not our thinking, what we think about things isn't the whole thing, or it's not the important thing even. No, uh, people are, just like in a meditation, people are advised to observe their thoughts, but not to get attached to them, not to get um, guided by them, and mostly we direct people into their bodies. Ah. Like whenever, you know, really, when we tell people, whenever you find yourself up here, just connect with your body. What's going on in your body? What's happening in your belly? What's happening in your chest? What's happening in your throat? What's happening on a somatic level? That's what the truth Right. So the, the stored trauma in the body is part of what people are afraid of feeling. Absolutely. So, so with the plant medicine as a support and the, the shamans and the other people that are there, is that what helps people kind of feel safe enough to allow that in? Well, the plant will literally guide you to where you're holding the pain. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it's an airing, really accurate and going to precisely the points of tension. So people will have all kinds of perturbation in their intestines or tightness in their chest or, 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 or the pain in their back. Or we'll tell, We tell people, wherever the pain is, the plant's going to go there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to welcome that. Right, right. So I know. The sense of safety is provided by the degree to which, during the preparation process, we're able to connect with people. Right. And, and just like in any other form of therapy. So in that sense, it's not different from anything else that we do. Mm -hmm. Where um, Stephen Porges says that safety is not the absence of threat, but the presence of connection. Mm -hmm. So if people come into the ceremony with that connection, and you know, by that time they're connected with the group, we're all in the same boat. Mm -hmm. um, they have processed, talked about a lot of their stuff. The, the safety is provided by the context. And, and when people don't experience safety or where they get safety, they can get really scared. Right. All right? Which sometimes they do, mm -hmm. which is okay. Because the fear they're experiencing is precisely the fear they've been suppressing all their lives. Right. So in my books, there's no bad trips. There's just experience. And I, I have no stake in somebody experiencing angels and, uh, and seraphim and, uh, and, and their highest self, which sometimes people do, mm -hmm. or courage or love or light or strength. I mean, that's great when people do, but that's not the intention. The intention is to experience whatever's there. Right. And then as we clear out some of the trauma, then, then there's more room for everything. The plant is interesting that way. Uh, it doesn't necessarily go to the trauma right away. 
uh, it, it might actually take you to love or, or to safety or to, uh, it might. Uh, my first experience was half an hour after ingesting it and listening to the music in the background, I just had tears of joy and gratitude rolling down my cheeks and I thought how beautiful, you know, now, you know, the second night, <laughs> I had nothing but resistance and discomfort, you know. It's right. almost like, I joked about it. It's almost like the typical drug pusher who, the first one is free. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So my, my first one was free. I said, oh my God, this is yeah. it. I want more of this, you know. <laughs> Next time, kaboom, you know. Right. So I, you can never predict. Right. So it, it, it doesn't follow. And, and by the way, there's a kind of um, um, built-in safety in that people who experience what they're ready for experience. Mm -hmm. they, they won't experience what they're not ready for, not ready to experience. Well, and that's one of my questions about it is that we have these defense mechanisms and we suppress what we can't be present with. Yeah. And then this, this plant medicine kind of dissolves those mechanisms. If you're ready to be dissolved, you have to cooperate with it. So you still have to cooperate, okay. You're not a passive recipient. Okay. It's quite possible to stay in resistance the whole night. The whole time. As I can tell you personally. Okay. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a resistance hero, if you like. You know, I'm a hero of the resistance. <laughs> I can lie there the whole night just resenting the fact that I got a stomachache. Yeah. Yeah. And why, why can't I see jaguars or anacondas like, every, like some other people do? You know? Yeah. 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 So, so, I mean, you have to work with it and, and you have to develop a relationship with it. You're not a passive. Um, victim of it or of a passive subject of it. In fact, if you're passive, it's just not going to work. Right. Any, so more than, any, any more than therapy will. Yeah. Well, and in therapy, some of the studies recently have been that it almost doesn't matter what the therapy is. It's the relationship that you have with the therapy that makes it safe enough for you to go in and experience it. Well, that's right. And, and with the ayahuasca, it's very much your willingness to have a relationship with the plant. Oh, okay. And, and sometimes, sometimes people will actually speak to the plant and say, I don't want to go there, or why are you showing me this? Please tell me, you know, and, and they'll get an answer. Wow. That sounds like an amazing, um, not, not shortcut, but an amazing way to go deeply into knowing ourselves and releasing some of that resistance. Well, um, it, uh, it, it's like a, a spaceship as opposed to a, a bicycle, you know, I mean, for, for a lot of people. Now, having said that, it's not pure advantage because if you cover a country by bicycle, it's slower and more effortful, but you also get to know it and That's get a relationship to it, you know, because you go spaces, you know. So, the ayahuasca experience does require a lot of integration afterwards. You know, it's, you don't get there just because you got there. Right. You know, having the experience. Well, any, any more than in any spiritual work, if you have this beautiful transcendental experience, that still requires, very, very few people have such deep or transformative experiences that the work is done just because you've had the experience. Right. Some people like that who got who have uh, epiphanies or nirvana experiences and all that, but those are very rare. Uh, whether whether you do it by any means, whether it's psychedelics or what you do. Right. So, and one of the things that tends to happen then is we chase after those wonderful experiences. And so, one of the things you were talking about in the article was that what's important is the meaning of the right. experience. So can you talk a little bit about the integration and what happens after the experience? Let me tell you a funny story. Uh, uh, so I was leading a retreat with the plant in a Latin American country maybe five years ago now. And there was a woman there in her 40s who was just stuck in her life. She experienced it and she was stuck in, um, in her marriage and in her work. There were just obstacles everywhere. And so her intention was to remove the obstacles, you know, or, or to see them clearly, you know, because they're always, these obstacles are always within ourselves. And um, 
next morning after the so that was so we had the process thing and the, and the you know the the intention setting and laying the ground then we have the hours experience then after we sleep then we process what happened so in our retreats we we have the preparation then the experience and then we process the experience she was just seething with anger and then she said i talked about this before she says uh, all I saw was this psychedelic elephant uh, with uh, uh, many arms, you know. Uh, and and I, I didn't have to I didn't have to come all the way here to Latin America to to see a psychedelic elephant. I could have taken acid and done this at home. Right. And I said, just just a minute. Tell me about that elephant. And turns out to be Ganesha, who's the uh, the Hindu god of removing obstacles. <laughs> she knew that on some level. Yeah. You know. So here's Ganesha shows up. I'm here to help you remove obstacles, and this woman, instead of being curious about it, gets angry about it. So yeah. she, uh, all she had to do, all she would have had to do, was ask, "Why are you showing up? What are you trying to tell me?" Mm -hmm. But she didn't. You know. So the meaning. The meaning really was that she has to be open to what arises inside her. Right. That's the meaning. And so she just laughed. When she got that, she just laughed. And she got it. Her life has really moved forward since then. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So right. she has to be open to what arises inside her. Right. And of course, it's the nature of trauma is that we don't open ourselves to what happens inside us. We shut it down. We're afraid of it. Mm-hmm. So that's a very simple example of how the meaning was right there. She simply had to grasp it. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it takes time, without the plant anyway, it takes time to have those experiences of, I can feel this, I'm, I made it through that, okay, I survived feeling that, and to, to really kind of explore that country by bicycle and to gradually get the, the confidence and the safety that it's okay. And so with the plant medicine and then the support. Yeah, so with the plant medicine, again, um, there's a lot of people just go for the ceremonies themselves. The, the, this therapeutic model, uh, this group process, it's increasingly be adopted by people, but for the most part, that's not what many, many people ah, experience. Okay. And they have powerful, beautiful experiences just with shamans and just with the plant. Not that this model is totally required, but it certainly adds a richness to it. Right. Much deeper and allows much more consistent integration. Mm -hmm. So this is just a model that we've developed where, see that we're using the original in the Amazon. Uh, partaking ceremony would be uh, people who knew each other. It wouldn't be a bunch of strangers flying in together from all right. over the world and then not knowing the language, they have a ceremony with a strange shaman. That's not how it would work. So there'd be a cultural context to it. Right. And, uh, and, and the meanings would be more available to them. So we thought, how can we reproduce that to the extent that we can? Mm -hmm. so this is why we came up with the idea of a group that doesn't just come together for one night and then disperses in the morning, but actually stay together for at least a week or 10 days. And we have a number of ceremonies where they accompany one another, where they support one another, where they, where they de develop an increasing sense of safety and belonging and inter interconnection, or where they get to know the shaman. And, and then when we get to actually talk about the experience and, 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 and communally find a meaning in each person's experience and, and where people really support one another. The other beauty of that process is I always tell people at the beginning, guess what? You just find yourself back in your family of origin because all the stuff that you've experienced in the family of origin, the resentment, the anger, the, the love, the disconnection, the connection, the, the jealousy, the envy, the, uh, the rejection, it's going to happen because your mind will bring it into it. Right. Your mind will project it onto particular individuals in the group. You know, welcome to your worst nightmare. You know, and, and, and also to, yeah. your best, to your most uh, beautiful dream. Mm -hmm. Family that's going to be supportive and loving, and that's what it is by the end. Right.
So that, that, that group process is, we just find it so important. Well, and then they get to experience directly that they can be safe in a group, they can be authentic and open, and that that's not, you're not going to be shamed for that. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, 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 and because of the power of the plant experience, the opening, you might say the stripping of pretension and self-pretension is so rapid that along, along with that comes a tremendous vulnerability. Yes. And, and with that vulnerability comes tremendous learning. That, that, that's the power of the plant experience. Now, of course, people do this in other settings. It's, it doesn't require a plant or a psychedelic. It's just a super show. Let me just say one more thing about the plant experience. Oh, sure. Is that I, I touched upon it. I just want to make it clear that people also experience their strength and their beauty and their love and their courage and their clarity and their uh, wisdom and their openness. In other words, these essential qualities of, of who they are in a way that they may have never experienced before. So that's the other side of it. So it, it's not, I talk about the trauma a lot, because I think it's important to, to process it, but a lot of people will be an affirm mm -hmm. of who they are underneath the uh, confusions of, of, of the ego personality. So that's another important part of the ayahuasca experience. And, and let me tell you a story about that. Um, I just found out recently. Um, in, in hockey, uh, if you follow hockey, um, every team will have an enforcer, some big muscular guy who is not necessarily a great hockey player, but he can beat the heck out of other people. And so he'll, he'll be called upon to fight. And a lot of these guys have very difficult lives because they're usually small town kids who don't have a lot of education or possibilities. They're, they know how to skate, but they don't have the hockey finesse. So they're really there, they're, 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 they're like paid goons, highly paid goons. And for some reason, the hockey world encourages and allows that kind of um, thuggery. And a lot of these guys end up getting, getting head injuries, being punched a lot, and they have very difficult lives. So there's a hockey enforcer that I know about um, who did a psychedelic. It wasn't ayahuasca at first, it was uh, DMT. And he realized we're all one. So the next time he's on the ice and he's supposed to be fighting, he says, what am I doing? This person is the same as me. It is me. And he did, and then, he did then he went to a shaman that's from ayahuasca. Uh, uh, ceremony, and now he's a Kundalini yoga teacher and a life coach. <laughs> That's awesome. Which is like an amazing outcome, you know? Yeah. But, but nobody familiar with the plant would be terribly surprised, but it, nevertheless, it's totally inspiring. So sometimes you just wish that other people could, a lot more people could have access to these kind of experiences. It, it would have taken him. I don't know how many decades of therapy to, if he, if he ever would have got there, yeah. you know. Right. So he feels connected with other people instead of fighting against them all the time. He sees them as one. He sees them still, as one. I'm fighting against myself. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. A lot of the, you know, a lot of the way that people Kind of deal with trauma or or navigate their lives after trauma is through the fight reflex yeah and that causes so much tr trouble and pain in their lives and other people's lives oh, absolutely. yeah now i should also mention the downside to ayahuasca i, I mean I, I don't want to paint for anybody any kind of romanticized idealized picture first of all although the outlines of what happens is is how i described it it's not necessarily immediate it's not necessarily universal. Everybody has to develop their own relationship to it. And, and you know, it's like with anything else, you might need to do it. You might choose to do it repeatedly. And some people, and it becomes like a, a path. Others, two or three experiences, that's all they want, that's all they need. The downside is that there are some people that, sh first of all, I, I really warn people against doing it on their own. 
There's right. some, yeah, there's some people who've had great experiences on their own. I, I, I know some, but I don't recommend it. It's like playing with fire. It's like the sorcerer's apprentice, playing with powers that are stronger than you can right. regulate. Yeah. Number one. Number two, uh, it's not a party drug. So when you read these descriptions of people getting together in some loft in Manhattan, and you know, it's not, you need to honor the tradition. This is a tradition. And, and, and you have to respect it. If we own say, you know, mm -hmm. and that's just, um, you should do it with people that are experienced and, and trained. And, and the people that train as shamans, or as carols, they go through a very rigorous process such as you know, involves years of solitary ceremonies or ceremonies, um, plant the ethos where they avoid lots of condiments, salt, sugar, sex. Uh, they might meditate alone in the jungle for a week at a time. I mean, it really is a rigorous training. If you really want to work with this plant, you, you just can't use it like candy. Right. Um, Ideally, if you're going to do it, there should be the kind of group psychotherapeutic setting that I've that we developed. That's becoming more and more prevalent, but there's still not a lot, still not a lot of it. Then again, in the ayahuasca world, just like anywhere in the therapeutic world or the spiritual world, there's the potential for exploitation. Right. There have been X number of Buddhist teachers who have sexually exploited their clients, usually female clients, mm -hmm. any number of psychiatrists or psychotherapists have done the same thing. Yeah. That can happen in the ayahuasca world, and there are shamans who will, even in the middle of ceremony, sexually exploit female clients. Mm -hmm. You have to be warned about that. You have to really know where you're going and do your due diligence. Right. Uh, then certain people should not do it. Uh, people with Episodes of psychosis, mania, or severe um, spreading and dissociative identity disorder. It can be a bit risky, more than a bit risky, that stuff will emerge or states will arise that we can't, cont can't contain. Because mm -hmm. the holding environment is just not there for it. Right. And it might be much longer processing than we can provide at a retreat or over one night for sure. Mm -hmm. Most people we generally don't accept for the retreats. Um, and finally, I, in this article that it's in Psychotherapy Networker this month, I talk about cultural appropriation. Um, this uh, modality was developed in the jungle by people whose ways of lives are very often threatened by industrialization and the spread of industrial agriculture and people bringing money but not supporting the ecology and so on, so and not respecting the culture. So we have to be aware of that as well. Right. Right. So that's what I would say about ayahuasca. There are some cautions there, yeah. Yeah. The other aspect is the the essential self. What Dick Schwartz and I in, in internal family systems might call the self with the capital S. And perhaps what people in the Ridwell school talk about is, is the essential self. I, you know, not, not, not everybody recommends going that route, but I'm just telling you that those aspects of the self can show up and when, it, when, when they do, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful experience that then you have to integrate, but, but uh, it's such a relief and a joy to experience it. And that that experience can happen in many different ways. One of it is through the ayahuasca, the whole experience. Sometimes yeah. meditation or spontaneously, all kinds oh, yeah. of, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and there's many, many schools of work that, yeah. that, that really have that as their goal, that you should experience that. And, and I, I, don't, I don't want to say there's anything special about the ayahuasca that way. It's only that it can be so... I had some resistance to it before I started hearing from you about it. And I, I respect your work so much that I thought, well, there must be something here or Gabor wouldn't be going into this and doing this. And so that's partly what's kind of opened my 
mind and, and some space for seeing the, the wonder of it and the, the power of it. And, well, yeah. um, in fact, uh, next year, we're organizing a very special retreat just for health, uh, healthcare workers, professionals, oh. um, to work with the plant, to enhance their work. Wow. So, um, it, uh, it's worth considering. Um, I'm not, by the way, I'm not recruiting people. Uh, <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah. There are plenty of people coming. I'm just saying that uh, yeah. people who are in therapy, who are therapists themselves, who attended our retreats, they say that the day after they go back, there's a huge difference in their work. Right. You know, in the depth of the interaction with the clients. So I was, I've been doing a bit of reading around um, LSD yeah. and some of the research that's been going on in medical settings and people with cancer, anxiety, depression, that kind of thing. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Do you mean LSD or do you mean psychedelics in general? Psychedelics in general or, or going specific if you want. Something happened in the 60s. There had been a lot of work with LSD, for example, in, uh, um, in, in mental illness and addictions. Some of it actually up here in Canada. And um, people were made, finding some very um, encouraging results. But in the 60s, um, two streams converge to to undercut that work one was the counterculture where a lot of young kids started doing psychedelics out of the alienation out of the desire for something better out of their desire to escape but we had to use lsd and other psychedelics in ways that were not guided by wisdom or experience I was one of them. Yeah. Well, yeah. What was, so what was your experience? Actually, not bad. Pretty good. I never had a bad trip, but right. certainly it was not anything other than, I, there was nothing whiz wise about it. I'll put it that way. Yeah. So some people have some very difficult or bad experiences. Bad yeah, trips. some people do. I mean, there were people who thought they could fly and throw themselves off buildings, that kind of stuff. And there was a lot of scary stories that were going around. Yeah. Yeah. So that gave it a very bad reputation, uh, combined with the desire of what you might call the establishment to squash the counterculture, mm-hmm. and 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 then the war on drugs and all that, and 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 these psychedelics got inflated with the uh, with with you know with the addictive drugs and so on. Right. So there was a lot of repression that came down, and so a lot of the research stopped and it kind of stood still for quite a long time. No. However, in the last couple of decades, it, it's become really apparent that a lot of what we have embraced as healing modalities in the context of mainstream medicine are only marginally helpful or useless, and in many cases, worse than useless, which is to say harmful. Right. It's true. As a medical doctor, I mean, I know that. So again, there was this... So, so in, in a sense, the... Resurgence of psychedelics, which is very much uh, the case today, is a response to the failures, on, on, on one hand, to the crisis of Western society, and on the other hand, the failure of Western medicine, or the limitations of Western medicine. Because Western psychiatric practice never gets at the root of anything. We deal with symptoms, we deal with... Um, diseases so called that themselves are symptoms of underlying trauma, but they never deal with the underlying events. And they don't even have any concept of the true self. I mean it doesn't have to even exist. Yeah. So uh, there's been an interest in, in a renewed interest in psychedelics. And there's been serious research. Uh, so for example, psilocybin, you know, an extract of mushrooms, magic mushrooms so called, they study the end of life anxiety. And people have these spiritual experiences, which either eliminates or is significantly subsides by end of life anxiety. Now, of course, the obvious question is, is there anything specific about end of life anxiety? Well, no, anxiety is anxiety. So if it works for that, why wouldn't it work in other settings? It, it, it was a lot for end of life anxiety, because I suppose, ethically, it could be argued that these people are gonna die anyway, so, why not give them this possibility? 
really it opens up the potential for uh, much broader research. Um, that's what psilocybin. Um, MDMA, uh, which the popular name for it is ecstasy, is being not studied for uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And as you know, the, there's major studies going on. I mean, multi-million dollar studies, um, MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, which is an organization founded by uh, Dr. Rick Doblin, um, is, is, is the advance of funding and, and, and promoting these studies. Multi-center studies, very rigorous protocol. And um, the, 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 the early indications are that with MDMA, a, a few sessions, they're getting much further with PTSD than they've done with any other modality. And so the FDA in the States has declared it a breakthrough um, form of treatment, which doesn't mean that it's generally available yet, but it means that it's in third phase now, which wow. means that the expectation is that within two or three years, it will be approved use by pain therapists. No, it's very time intensive. Think about it. Uh, in, the, in the model, it's uh, an MDMA session takes about six hours and four to six hours. And uh, it takes two therapists. That's time intensive, expensive, obviously. Um, but on the other hand, it seems to be better than anything else. Right. So maybe in the long term, it'll even be, it'll even be cost effective. Right. So well, look at all of the costs of treating people with these marginally effective or harmful modalities. Yeah. Or, not, or not treating them. Or not treating them. Treating them as, um, as aberrant personalities or as, or, right. you know, when they act out, you treat them as a criminal uh, yeah. uh, issue rather than a health issue. You know, so the costs, the, 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 the throwaway costs right now are enormous. So in any case, um, you know, I've worked with a number of different modalities. I've worked with the mushroom, I've worked with um, MDMA, uh, some animal. I've worked with something called 3 MMC, which is kind of a relative of MDMA, and each of them have their own particular uses, and, and each of them have their own particular indications. And they're not exactly interchangeable. You know, so one would love to know, not that there's any absolute indication or, or guidebook, but one would have to know what is appropriate and when. And um, these are not for individual experimentation. They're really right. Uh, you have to be, you have to have some experience and and and, and guidance in, before you before you work with these uh, modalities. But they're worth exploring. And 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 given the limitations of everything else that we have to offer, uh, there's been some you know very good other modalities for PTSD like EMDR and so on and 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 and. Uh, uh, Dick Schwartz's IFS model, Internal Family Systems model, I've been very impressed with recently. Um, so it, they're not exclusive. It's just one more thing in the armamentarium that we can consider. So can you talk a little bit more about someone with PTSD who's going to use MDMA in this kind of a clinical setting? What would be some of the, um, like how would you decide if that was going to be appropriate for them? And what's going on in the brain and in the nervous system that how does that work when they take that drug? You know, Len, you're pushing me beyond the limits of my expertise. Okay. Uh, I, I worked with MDMA, but not I've not been part of the official trials. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, there is, um, I know I work with it, you know, but mm -hmm. uh, there's a protocol. Mm -hmm. so there's strict, there's strict, uh, for, the, for the MAP studies, there's a strict protocol of, 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 of who gets accepted. Mm -hmm. So it has to be uh, PTSD, but I think without other complicating diagnoses. Oh, okay. Preferably, I think, an identifiable trauma. You know? Um, and again, they have their own particular way of doing it. I've not been trained in it, so I don't want to talk about it. Oh, okay. So someone who has... Uh, trauma from being in war and is having flashbacks of going back into that experience would be someone who's very different than has complex PTSD 
and is have has all of that attendant yeah. and and I don't know in the map studies how they would differentiate, but I think the more discreet the the trauma, the more um, amenable they are for that kind of treatment. Yeah. No, having said that, of course, when you look at PTSD and somebody who's a combat um, subject to it, it's usually not about the combat. There's usually underlying childhood trauma that, that is being evoked or, or um, heightened, exacerbated by whatever happened in combat. So right. it's all, in a sense, it's always complex. So from that point of view, it's always complex. Right. I think it's really clear that we can't afford the cost of war on our mental health, on our, and there's so many, the people that are first responders, police, firefighters in the military, there's just such a high cost. I don't think our systems are meant to, to integrate that and to handle that. Well, of course, one way to look at all this is that PTSD is not an abnormality. PTSD is a normal response to an abnormal experience. Right. It, it, it's, it's a way of the body absorbing it and even protecting against it. So that uh, when you push people beyond uh, what is meant to be human endurance and, 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 and when they lack support, these things will normally develop. I mean, when a, when a combat veteran with PTSD hears a, a car backfiring and he, and, he, and he hurls himself to the ground in self-protection, that's a normal response. It is. That's a normal, there's nothing abnormal about it. You know? So, so again, that with, the, with the psychedelic experience in general, you get to defend these responses. You get to see how naturally you, you you get not to be ashamed of them. you get to see that what else could your system have done you know and i've seen that with ayahuasca over and over and over again so you right. might say ultimately that um the, the psychedelic experiences when they work uh, result in a befriending of the self right which ultimately is the aim of all kind of therapy, isn't it? No. It is, yeah, yeah. And the, the piece about the shame, when we understand that this is actually how a system works, then the shame tends to dissolve around how we blame ourselves for how we reacted. Yeah, well, of course, the shame is always arising from the question, what's wrong with me? Right. What's wrong with me? But that's not a question. What's wrong with me is a statement that there's something wrong with me. Now, mm -hmm. When you reformulate that, not what's wrong with me, but what happened to me. And what happened inside me is the result of what happened to me. There's no longer shame there. Right. Now it just becomes a question to be explored. And that opens it up a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I, again, I think what I'm emphasizing here is that the, the second I look in its intention and it's an in insight not all that different from what we intend to do in therapy in general. It just happens to be a, a very quick way of, 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 of um, pulling down the boundaries to, to, to that deep experience. So when we're willing and we feel like there, it's okay, then, then that's an aid. It's something that can help us to go deeper. Yes, and, and when there is the context where you really do experience safety. Right, yes. And, and uh, sometimes when people say, well, I, I didn't have a deep experience, um, in a certain setting, I'll explore that with them, and it turns out that quite properly, they just didn't feel safe enough. Right. So what they thought was the failure of the plant experience was actually a healthy defense against the lack of safety in the context in which they had the plant experience. Exactly, yeah. Do you want to talk a, a bit about your new book, The Myth of Normal? How does that tie in with this? Well, so it's so new that I haven't even started writing it yet. But oh, okay. okay. In fact, 
just this month, publishers are looking at it. Um, okay. And I will have a chapter there on the, on the, on the psychedelic experience. But essentially, so I don't want to talk about it too much just yet, but I'll, I'll, but I'll, I'll just mention that the, the, the essence of it, the myth of normal and the subtitle right now is illness and health in an insane culture. And, and what I'm saying is just what I said earlier is that illness and, and mental illness and the physical illness, they're not abnormalities. They're normal responses to an abnormal culture. And the abnormality of this culture is that it denies basic human need. So when, for all the economic um, benefits that many of us, far from all of us, experience in the US, uh, our basic human needs are, are, are not honored in this culture. And that suppression that, or that ignoring of basic human needs in a materialistic culture of control and exploitation leads to a lot of disease, physical and mental. And so that normality in this culture is a myth because what is normal, what the norm is, is actually abnormal when it comes to a basic human need. So that's the, that's the theme of that book. And, and again, uh, uh, I'll include a chapter on the, uh, on the psychedelic world as, as a way of going, diving underneath that abnormality into what is really normal. Right. Yeah, cool. So we're just about at the end of our time. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to ask, so one of the things that you talk about over and over and over again is connection, that the effect of trauma is a disconnection from ourselves, from our sense of value, from the present moment. We dissociate, we go into fight, flight, all of those things that happen. So what would you suggest or say to someone who is starting to get that, starting to see how disconnected they are? Maybe they're using some kind of an addiction. Probably we are. Most of us still do even. What would you say is are some kind of really important key things for them to know? Well, the answer is by the question. Because when you say you're starting to see how disconnected you are, who's seeing it? The, person, the, the part that's seeing it is exactly the part that's connected. Otherwise, you wouldn't see it. <laughs> True. Yeah. So, so the thing is to work with that part. Right. What, what does it take to strengthen that part and give it more uh, agency? It's, it's the disconnected parts of us that run our lives very often. The part that can see the disconnection, even though at some point in the early stages might only be a rather impotent the voice, nevertheless, impotent in the sense that it doesn't override the disconnected voice, nevertheless, is the growing connection with the true self. And so, but it's the plant work, spiritual work, psychotherapeutic work, and sometimes, you know, somatic work, uh, yoga, meditation, uh, or through all of these modalities, it, it, it's 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 uh, it's a matter of um, broadening the scope of that awareness to to be the agent in your life. So when you talk about agent and agency, and that role in addiction, there's so much blame and shaming of people with addiction. What's another, what, how do you think about that? Or how do you frame that? Oh, well, for that, I go back to the very beginning of our discussion, where I point out that the addiction was actually a perfectly mm, natural uh, attempt to solve a problem that you had no solution for. Right. So, of course, you used heroin, you are in so much pain, you had no other way of killing, of, of, of resolving the pain. Of course you used cocaine because it made you feel alive because you felt so dead. Or crystal meth. Or, or, of course you drank alcohol because uh, uh, there was so much distress that the alcohol suited for you. Um, of course you, uh, you engaged in even pornography, uh, pornography addiction 
because you do some of your sexually alive without being vulnerable. Without being vulnerable, yeah. The essence of pornography addiction. It's a way of being sexually alive and in control without being at all vulnerable. So hurting your vulnerability. These were uh, totally understandable responses. Nothing to be ashamed of. Right. Nothing to be ashamed of. Things to explore. Be curious about. Befriend it. But not to be ashamed of. And that deep compassion that we can have. One of the things in, um, for people who aren't familiar with your Compassionate Inquiry workshops, one of the things that really affected me when you were working with somebody was how you had them have a look at how would they feel towards or would they feel compassion towards a daughter, a niece, a friend who is in that situation and how we, we don't judge other people the way we can be so harsh with ourselves. That's right. People have sometimes difficulty recalling. They might physically recall the details of what happened to them, but they will not be in touch with the emotional side of it. In a kind of a dis 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 disconnected, uh, flat affect. But when you say to them, don't try and remember what it was like for you because you can't. You can't recollect it because you repressed the emotions. That's how you survived it. Right. So the depression was a survival. Nothing wrong with it. That's how you survived. But imagine your daughter or your son or a friend, son or daughter in that situation. How would that child feel? Oh, their compassion can arise. Right. Well, then you say, well, can you direct that compassion towards yourself now? Uh, that self-compassion is the most difficult part. And actually, in ayahuasca ceremony, sometimes we'll very, sometimes I'll coach people to ask the plant to show them self-compassion. For once in their life, can you have an experience of a night where you have compassion for yourself? And the plant is very efficient at doing that. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. And I listened to so much of your, so many of your interviews and read your articles. And I wanted to do, you know, get into something that was, didn't have you repeating what you say all the time. Right. So I've really enjoyed this conversation and I know it'll be really helpful. Thank you, Lynn. It's good to speak with you again. Yeah, thank you. Go to KillabyCenter.com, Radical Recovery Summit. For access to the interviews, you can watch them free online, or you could purchase an all-access pass, killabycenter.com.